Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Triple Play, that podcast in black. Because this week we watched Men in Black. Written by Ed Solomon, Robert Gordon, Barry Fanaro, and Eaton Cohen. Uh, directed by Barry Sonnenfeld. And released in 1997, 2002, and 2012. <laughs> nice 10-year gap between the second and the third one there to let it marinate for a bit. Yeah, you know, I really like the, the release order of these movies. So first you have five years. And then you have 10 years, and then the fourth one just ruined it all by being nine years. It should have been 20. Wasn't it seven years for the... Th- oh, yeah, seven. Should have been 20. Should have been 20, yeah. Should have been 15. No, well, because you're going five, and then you double it to 10, double it to 20. You could also just add five every time, five to 10 to 15. Well, I'm doubling it. So then after that, you get 40, and then 80. Great. Great. <laughs> 80-year gap. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Men in Black. I've actually seen all three of these before we watch this. Not back to back, obviously. Or maybe not necessarily obviously, I guess, but but yeah, I've seen all three of them. Nice. I'd seen none of them. I vaguely knew about what the series it's a was. Surprise, but... since like Men in Black was the uh, biggest movie franchise of the turn of the century until Lord of the Rings showed up. <laughs> well, and the new Star Wars movies, which are now well, those are 2003, ones. so those were. Well, 99, 2002, 2005. Uh, 99. <clears throat> the biggest original IP. <laughs> it's not original, though. A lot of people don't know, apparently, that it's based on a comic book. Because the movies because are the way comics more popular were like, than a comic the, the comics were like, I looked it up, there were like three issues. Six. And yeah, but three. those other three were released after the movie no, came no, out. No, no, no. They were they, super they were popular. Released, no, they were... And after them, uh, it was bought out by Marvel. No, no, there was two, three released in 1990... And then three more released in like 91 or something. But the comic books I actually read, and let's just start here with the comics, because that's the genesis of all of this. The comics um, are really um, way more dark in tone than the movies, and they're not really comedies at all. Yeah, I think Barry Sonnenfeld and Spielberg were the ones who made the big choice to move away from the hard-boiled action of the comics. (laughs) Move away from the depressing nature of the comics for a more comedic approach. They the comics also didn't only deal with aliens in the comics the men in black um, also investigate um, basically everything that's weird yeah anything supernatural so like, I guess ghosts probably psychics um, stuff like that don't think the neuralizers were a part of the original original comics because I read that uh, instead of making people forget the men in black they just killed all witnesses <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, there you go. I mean, there you have, like, an instance of the movies making it way more lighthearted. <laughs> the movies may have almost gone in completely way too far in the lighthearted direction, as I'll talk about in a few minutes when I talk about the original ending of the first Men in Black movie. That Barry Sonnenfeld was like, that's not gonna work. I know what you're talking about. That actually seems a little darker to me, That the original ending, from, mm-hmm. what, I, from what I read. Well, um, but anyway, right, they decide to make this movie. Well, I think it was uh, Robert Ed Solomon. Sorry, Robert Gordon was the same. Ed Solomon wrote the original script based on the comics, I think actually like a couple of years before it got made. As is kind of the norm for a lot of these trilogies, I'm starting to notice. I mean, you have to start a movie a few years before it gets made. Yeah, but it's, it seems to be a trend on this podcast that the movies like get a script before having a studio nailed down. <clears throat> it's more of a problem for Men in Black 3 as we'll get to. <laughs> well, not the whole having a studio nailed down thing, but just like not having a script for most of the production. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of things to say about that because I found an interview where Barry Sonnenfeld basically like contradicted himself on that whole story. There's a lot of rumors and, and hearsay and just people saying different things about the entire production of that movie. But anyway, Ed Solomon wrote this script, and apparently it was a lot more f- faithful to the comics in that it, it took place over, like, multiple places in the United States, including, I think, like, New Mexico and Texas and New York, but most of it was apparently set underground, and Barry Sonnenfeld was like, that's not going to make a very interesting movie. Well, what I read about this whole thing is that Barry Sonnenfeld's reason for wanting it to take place in New York was for it to be more realistic. 
which is a kind of a shoddy reason. I don't know if that's actually true. Well, like, that's according to what I read. That's what he said. Well, what he said about why it would be more re- realistic was because he's like, if there were aliens living on Earth, they would live in New York because you just walk down the street in New York and there's just people wearing like whatever the heck and just people, nobody's like even phased by the weird stuff you see in New York. And that's <laughs> like why he said it would be more realistic because aliens mm. could live in New York and like New York is just unfazed. I guess. Fine. <laughs> I'll let that slide. It's what Barry. he alleged. I'll let that slide. It's what Barry. he alleged. Be careful next time. Be careful next time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. As if he's listening to this podcast. He probably is. I doubt it. I highly doubt it. <laughs> I don't. He turned the. I, I I found out because I never knew what this building actually was. The the MIB headquarters. It's the, it's Epcot Center, New York. <laughs> you didn't know that? No, the big, like, just basically square building. Oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm <laughs> apparently, apparently this is a ventilation tunnel uh, shaft for the tunnel, the road tunnel that connects, connects, uh, I think, Brooklyn. It goes underneath the, the river to, I think, Manhattan Island. <laughs> So I, and it's a vent it's a ventilation shaft basically for that tunnel. There's four of them. There's four ventilation shafts. Not all of them look like this big square building. But I guess Barry Sonnenfeld saw it and was like, perfect. That's my MIBHQ right there. And it works because I guess nobody in the general public is gonna go into this building because it's it's basically just a maintenance building in real life. Well it's not like you have to worry about that. I mean movie crews have like a ton of power. Of like just keeping people out. Remember when we watched Insidious and they just like rented out a neighborhood and like really pissed off the people who lived in that neighborhood? Yeah. But I also mean like in the context of like if the men in black were real. Oh yeah, okay. Sure. But but is it like that's also the question. Is that building in the men in black movies, is that building the still the ventilation shaft? Or is it just like We never get a get an answer, I yeah. guess, but we never like zoom out and see where it is. We do zoom out and see that the entire universe is in a marble in another universe. We also zoom out and, <laughs> and find out that our world is in a locker of another world. I'm not sure how that like correlates with the being inside a marble. <laughs> yes, yeah, both at the same time. Wrap your head around that. <laughs> Thankfully, the third one doesn't introduce yet yeah, another the- layer to this onion. <laughs> I guess the marble is in the locker, but the mar- the locker is also within the marble. Mm. Oh, man. <laughs> So I don't know. Do you have anything else to say about script? Because I can move on to casting. I mean, I have some stuff to say about casting now. Well, just about the original ending, which I think fits into this script. Yeah. Section is apparently originally it was going to end with an existential debate between Jay and uh, the bug. And Barry Sonnenfeld was like, that doesn't really fit with the action we've put in the rest of the movie. And also it like wouldn't really fit with the tone of the movie either. Also, from what I read, it sounded like it kind of sucked. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but um, but the rewrites in accordance with that are also, I read, some of the reasons that spurred them on to animate the bug instead of having an animatronic. Right. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. There are actually more changes to the script that happened uh, allegedly like two weeks before the movie went out, <laughs> two weeks before uh. the completion of post-production. Uh, according to Barry Sonnenfeld, who, like, the more I read about these movies, the more I started to question, like, everything he said about everything. <laughs> but according to him, he he made these changes, like, two weeks before the movie came out. The changes are, like, before documented. Before it came out, not before it, like, went, whatever the term is, uh, before it, like, was solidified and no more changes were allowed to be made, but two weeks before it came out. Well, it's like there's, again, one of those things is, like, he said, she said, two weeks before the end of post-production, two weeks before it came out, who knows? But the changes themselves are actually, like, documented to have happened, that apparently the plot of the movie was, like, almost completely changed in these edits because originally there was going to be a third alien species involved in the plot line, so the tiny little galaxy that J and K are trying to rescue from... Uh, for the Ar- the Arcanans or whatever. And then there's that other alien species, the the bugs that want the Arcanan galaxy. So right, 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 yeah. Can, I can, like, destroy them. This, actually, yeah. And there was apparently a third alien race that was, like, sort of an intermediary that was going to be the one that was going to destroy Earth to get control of the Arcanian 
I hope I'm saying was, that right. I mean, it Galaxy. Was, it, I, what from my understanding of it was that it was essentially um, Earth caught in the crossfire of like this war between these two like galactic superpowers and the all and also the cockroaches or the cockroach guy, um, whatever his name was, uh, is just there also like messing about. That was my understanding of it. Just I think my understanding simply, of it was that the cockroach people were fighting the third alien species and the Arcanian galaxy was something that both sides wanted. Yeah, maybe it was that. I don't know. But then in post-prod, they like changed, They cut the third species entirely and it was going to be the Arcanians themselves who were just going to destroy Earth to prevent the galaxy from falling into the hands of the bug. Yeah, that's a lot more simple. There's This whole trilogy actually is like... A lot of work was done to keep the movies or make the movies more simple than what they originally were going to be. Like, so we have this, and then in Men in Black 3, the original script was like apparently way more complex than what we got. Yeah, and I like that. I think it works for these movies. We'll talk about that way later. Yeah. So as far as casting goes, Will Smith was never, like originally at first going to be uh, Agent J. J. Yeah, J. Apparently in the comics is a blonde-haired Caucasian man. I, I don't know how true this is, but I read that um, Sonnenfeld's first choice was David Schwimmer. <laughs> as Agent J. Wow. But then apparently uh, his Sonnenfeld's wife was a big fan of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and she was like, hey, maybe Will Smith should play Agent J. <laughs> It worked. Yeah, it worked a lot. It worked very well. I didn't find anything about Tommy Lee Jones' casting for this movie, but no, I did that's... find that Barry Sonnenfeld called their uh, their chemistry as like on a deeper level than just friends. He's like, there's an almost romantic aspect to their partnership. And I'm like, okay, Barry, all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Barry, <laughs> cool it. <laughs> and... uh well, that's all I had about casting. Honestly, couldn't find any information yeah, I, about I, like, any of the other Yeah, I had to casting. like explicitly try and look for casting information, and I still found like barely anything. <laughs> except I found a little bit about Josh Brolin in Mib Three, I guess. So there's like a surprisingly sparse amount of information about at least the first two. I know that there is, I guess, the quote preeminent unquote source of information about the first movie is a. Is a book called Comic Book Movies, which is about the making of comic book movies. I think pre Marvel. I think pre Marvel domination, though. And there's like a very, very sparse amount about Men in Black two, and then substantially more about three. Yeah, well, three is pretty, pretty modern. Three is in like the modern era of movies. I wouldn't say one and two. I say we're not in that era anymore. One and two are in the turn of the century era. Yeah. That Matrix era, so to speak, kind of. Even the Matrix, I feel like, was a bridge between that era and, and this one, in a way. Although I think, like, this era... I guess I'm just cat- categorizing eras based on my own preferences now, but I guess this era probably started around 07, 08 with uh, Marvel-type stuff. The Marvel domination. Yeah. That's what I would say. Because that <laughs> style is seeped into a lot of other movies. Thanks, Marvel. I think. I think. It's I basically know. everything. Thanks, Marvel. Thanks, Marvel. Nice bland color palettes. Nice flat music. Just great. <laughs> Just <laughs> the, great. The biggest defender is like the Iron Man sense of humor in every one of their movies. <laughs> Just and, great. And the Iron Man style, like using classic rock songs in every one of their movies. Okay, but they didn't start that, though. That was I a thing. I don't care who started it. They popularized it. Did they? I think, I think that so. was like... I think so. I don't think so at all, actually. Then who did? Well, that you'd have to give me some time. But I, well, I definitely think that was like prevalent before Marvel. <clears throat> well, luckily... Wait, was there a, like a pop song in Men in Black? Other than like Will Smith's song at the end. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so either. I can't remember one. Well, anyway. The came out, and it was a bigger hit than people were expecting, I think. Yeah. Apparently, there was some... Uh, well, there was a lot of 
practical effects for the first movie and some friction between Steven Spielberg, who was a producer oh, on right. these yeah, movies, and Barry Sonnenfeld, who was the director on uh, the look and feel of the aliens. And apparently, basically, everyone was like, we should give the aliens eyes. And Barry was like, no, no, why should they conform to the human conception of what, what they should be? And then Barry apparently saw the animatronic and was like, but how do they see? I guess they changed my mind. Put the eyes back on. It's like, wow, thanks, Barry. Yeah, I read some uh, testimony from a few of the um, effects people on this movie. I can't remember their names now. Um, who were like, yeah, this movie kind of was a nightmare of just... Go having to flip flop back and forth on what we were doing and stuff like that. Yeah, I know at least one guy was like Spielberg really liked the head and Barry really liked the body, and they're like, why not just combine the two? And he's like, but then it just looks weird. And he's like, but we had to do it anyway because because they were the bosses, so we did. <laughs> Barry talking about the eyes, like I guess I ended up where everybody else was. It just took me three months to get there, and it's like, thanks, Barry. That's three months of wages you wasted. <clears throat> Brought him back for the second one. And the third, uh, <laughs> even after he made the complete bomb of a movie, Wild Wild West, between the two of them. Well, that actually had some influence on Men in Black 2, like one of the few things I could find about Men in Black 2. But also just touching on some of the practical effects in Men in Black 1, the end when Will Smith Will Smith uh, crushes the cockroaches, those were actually mustard packets because uh, some humane society, it wasn't PETA, some humane society got involved and was like, I'm going to make sure you're not stepping on any cockroaches here. Wow. Cockro- they were that concerned about cockroaches. Yeah. Cockroaches. <sighs> sure, they were like Fun fact, bigger and, and like more important animals to care about, but okay. This society, if you step on a cockroach or kill a cockroach, just like in your home or whatever, this society actually shows up at your door not too long later. Went for a run about a week ago, and I saw a cockroach just like run across the sidewalk right in front of me, and I was like, "Well, that's a thing." Wow, broad daylight, huh? It was like eleven at night. Oh, wow! Yeah, so lots of practical effects. I think pretty much every alien was a practical effect in the first movie, except for the guy at the end who was CG. CG. The design for Men in Black headquarters was apparently drawn from the designs for JFK International Airport uh, yeah. because they said that if it was going to be like a, a hub point for aliens to arrive on Earth, it would make sense for it to look like an airport. So it was very like retro futuristic. The other thing they said was that since the Men in Black were allegedly founded in the 60s, they looked at a lot of like 60s uh, artwork and, and architecture for a lot of inspiration for things in this movie. Apparently, the the head practical effects guy said that more drawings were made for this movie than any other movie in his life. Like, more conceptual drawings. Yeah. <clears throat> and another little uh, tidbit um, or anecdote or whatever is Vincent, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio, yeah. Um, is apparently, I didn't know this until I looked this up, a known like method actor. So he really method acted and got into the character of, of his character um, and had to, uh, this has nothing to do with the method acting, but in the scene where he, he drinks the sugar water, um, they did 15 takes of that. So he drank 15 glasses of sugar water, right, one right after the other. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like diabetes central. <laughs> Also, just sounds sickening and makes like I would make my stomach chill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's all I could find for the first one, it's and I have even all less for the find. second one. The one thing I do have for the second one is um, something for the script, which is that I think Barry Sonnenfeld said this of like um, in Wild. He's like in Wild Wild West. We learned that people don't want to see Will Smith play the straight man. Yeah. So we really tried. So the original script had Will Smith, uh, Agent J, um, being by himself or with um, what's his face's character T. for yeah T for for a lot longer. But then they reduced that in the final movie, um, so that yeah. he could so that he could play the more comedic role earlier on and for more of the movie. Because Tommy Lee Jones is the straight man of these movies. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what their relationship is built on. Is a very. Uh basic comedic trope i guess yeah wild wild west was barry sonnenfeld's film between men in black one and two i've seen it it was really bad it's actually terrible it's about the wild it's it's, 
people don't know this either, but it's also based on, I think it's a comic. Huh. Uh, called the Wild Wild West, <laughs> and it's about these. Wow, what is it with these Barry Sonnenfeld movies dropping the the? Sorry to interrupt, but like the Men in Black to Men in Black, the Wild Wild West, to Wild Wild West. Come on, I don't what know. Are you doing? I don't know. But anyway, it's about like Will Smith's character, if you can even call it that, <laughs> what? and this other guy, and they like got to protect a town. Is uh, like President Grant oh. Oh, from like existential not existential but like extreme threats i remember it ends with a giant robotic dog mech thing controlled by like will smith i think in the civil war era there's also like the founding of the secret service apparently that like i think uh will smith's partner becomes like secret service agent number one oh it's it's adapted from a 60s tv series Ah, that's what it is that's what it is remember the the guy who played the lead guy in the the TV show said that the movie sucked as well. I think <laughs> sounds pretty cool to me from what you're describing. Like it's in- really bad. <laughs> you think a movie like that would be like it'd be impossible to get wrong? Like there'd be lots of action? Nope. There's like nothing at all. The critical consensus on rot. This is from Wikipedia. The critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes calls it a bizarre misfire in which greater care was lavished upon the special effects than on the script. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> The script is utterly nonsensical and often goes for lowest common denominator humor. So, uh, kind of like Men in Black. Yeah, but there's no, like, fart or burp <laughs> jokes in Men in Black. Are you Surprisingly. Really? Like, I, I can't remember not, any. I can't remember any either. So, surprisingly, because you'd think that'd be an easy target, but you know they avoided it, and for that I applaud them. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so I guess they learned at least one lesson from that movie going into the second one. I actually tried to look up, like, explicitly why Agent L, like, just disappeared between the movies. And I found an article that was, like, ten characters written out in the middle of a movie franchise for the worst reasons possible. Agent L was, like, number nine or something. And and what was the reason? And apparently no one really knows. Oh. <laughs> Great clickbait article there where they... they- they bait you for like top 10 reasons but, and they're like we okay, don't know the reason okay. sorry <laughs> okay well okay there's a little bit more than that because they they have this it's it's basically just a paragraph where they're like the actress yeah, who played course. Laurel set, the paragraph is like <laughs> very opinionated but the classic clickbait article the paragraph is like so the actress who played Laurel said that apparently there were rumors that it was because of money uh, because she like priced herself out of it because she asked for too much money. There was also another rumor that like Tommy Lee Jones didn't like working with her. And then it was like, well, apparently the actress herself just said that she had like a really busy schedule. And then the paragraph was like, considering she only released like one other film and like anywhere in the like three years surrounding this movie, can you really trust that statement? And I was like, okay, article, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's, that was it. That's all I could, that's literally all I could find. I looked through like five different websites. And they're like, well, and they just like skip over it. They're like, well, she was just written off in a line. And just said she disappeared off screen. I'm like, okay, but I know that. But I want to know like why out of universe. Couldn't find anything. I did Classic. try though. I did try. <clears throat> I find an interview with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith like right after the second one came out as well, and they were talking about the movie. Nothing really, like, noteworthy or or interesting in it. I mean, that's what you'll find. Well, actually, that's not true. I was going to say that's what you'll find, like... Yeah, I guess guess it is true in terms of, like, promotional material. Like, usually the more promotional interviews are not going to have too many interesting things. Right. Because a lot of the most interesting things are bad things, or, like, bad publicity. (laughs) If there is such a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. Remember yeah, the, that's literally all I could find for the second one. Yeah, the Other interview was uh, they were talking about how they were going to need a D de- de- neuralizer or something for uh, Asian K. I did find out they like revamped the neuralizer sound effect for the second movie. They like re-recorded it on a much higher bit rate technology. And here's a fun fact for you: the neuralizer sound effect is apparently the sound of a, a, an old camera flash recharging. I can't remember if they played it backwards or not, but it's like that's where they got the sound effect from. It's like an old camera flash recharging. Nice. 
But yeah, that's all I could find about the second yeah. one. Second one came out and made a lot of money like the first one did and was really And then they didn't make a third popular. one for 10 years. Well, I think the second one, um, we've talked about this before, rode the coattails of the first one. And then people didn't necessarily, I, I, I do think people probably liked the second one. I think the critical reception of the second one was a lot like worse average than to the good. first and one. Worse than the first, but like average to good. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, I mean, I'm not like I'm looking here for the Wikipedia page for like for Wild Wild West. And it's like, this was generally panned and hated by like everyone who watched it. I don't think it was that level. No. I just think it was worse than the first one. Actually, I just remembered something about the second one is that it suffered from Spider-Man 1 syndrome where the destruction of the Twin Towers caused a massive section of the film uh, to have yeah. to be reshot. Right. It's apparently the climax of the film where it's revealed that Rosario Dawson's character is the light of whatever the heck uh, was apparently filmed at the Twin Towers it was supposed to take place yeah. at the Twin Towers, and then they had to reshoot it on a different building because, well, the Twin Towers <laughs> got destroyed before yeah. the movie came out. Although the Twin Towers appear in the movie, if I remember correctly. Um, in t- I think it was in one that they appeared. Yeah, you might be right. They kind of all blend together because we wash them back to back. <laughs> How could they get that wrong in 1997? I mean, come <laughs> on. <laughs> Just kidding. Some classic 9-11 humor for you. <laughs> Jesus. But yeah, so apparently Will Smith proposed the the idea for the third one like on the set of the second one and they didn't like get around to making it till 10 years later. Well, I mean, considering he proposed time travel for the second one, they're like had the script ready and everything ready to go. It's no surprise that they wouldn't just add that in. I guess. <laughs> right? Well, the third one is where things get interesting because I didn't know this, but apparently Will Smith is known as a control freak on set. Mm-hmm. You know that? Um, I had heard rumors <laughs> about it. Yeah. These are, I mean, these are also rumors. What, everything we're about to say is all rumor, pretty much. I mean, I have a couple of things that I'm just going to quote directly from Barry Sonnenfeld in a bit, but that's more about, like, the script and everything. I don't know where you want to start for this, this movie. I just wanted to start with... All the things Will Smith did that pissed people off, or the things they said he did that they said pissed them off. First of all, his massive obnoxious trailer that people hated, both on the crew, and apparently it annoyed some local, you know, people in New York. They were like, yeah, Will Smith's trailer is huge, makes a lot of noise, uh, and it pollutes uh, more heavily than any other trailer. And we don't like it. Apparently, also, Will Smith would come into every set that they created. Oh, we didn't mention that um, for the first one, they recreated the... the tu- Or did we mention that? I don't remember. Recreated the what? The tunnel. I don't think we mentioned that, no. Well, now we have. <laughs> so apparently for the third one, Will Smith would appear on every set, uh, spend a lot of time just looking at it and trying to understand how all the parts work, uh, and then ask for deconstructions and revisions which were often done, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Could be worse. Could be worse, but that's pretty bad. No, I mean, it could be, like, way worse. It could be, like, Jared Leto method acting the Joker and sending dead rats to his uh, co-stars. Could be like that. (laughs) But that's not destruction of, like established work that's going destruction to destruction of mental health <laughs> <laughs> or destruction of just health in general of like you know get also sending true. diseased rats to people <laughs> send anthrax to people in envelopes <laughs> method act the joker <laughs> what, what, how did we get led into all of this yeah I guess it could be worse but this is still not good <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's not good it's like I say, it could be worse. If it's all true, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Will Smith and a couple other people denied any of these allegations. So He said, she said. But that's where we get no, into... Uh, Will Smith declined to comment. Which is not an admission of guilt. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Well, speaking of he said, she said, let's get into he said, he said, by which I mean Barry Sonnenfeld directly contradicting himself in different interviews. Because... Uh, Apparently, uh, a lot of people actually 
like a substantial number of people have like confirmed this that they went into filming men in black 3 without a script complete that yeah they, yeah no that's pretty much confirmed yeah well so i found an interview with this uh with this guy and this guy basically starts off before he even goes into the interview uh, he starts off with his whole on payoff he's like you know barry sonnefeld himself oh has God. said that men in black 3 started filming without a script and the title of this interview is like that time Barry Sonnenfeld got really heated in, in an interview or something. But this guy goes on. He's like, yo, Barry Sonnenfeld himself has said that we, they went into Man in Black 3 without a script. So he's like, so when I asked him about it, I don't know why he got so goddamn heated at me. He like just started like basically contradicting everything. He got really heated at me. He just got like really angry with me for even asking the question. He's like, I just don't understand. And I read through the interview and... It's actually, yeah, I mean, presumably the guy didn't, like, transcribe his questions, like, in a way that made himself seem, like, better. He asked, like, a really, like, logical question. He's like, you know, how how did you approach, like, filming these scenes with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones when you, like, didn't really, like, have the whole script complete? Like, you know, how did you, like, approach it? Yeah. Barry Sonnenfeld just goes off. He's like, no, it's like, how would you ever film a, a movie without a script being complete? We obviously had a script complete when we started filming. Like, we had well, we had a script going. We knew exactly where everything was going to go. Obviously, it wasn't the final script because we might cut scenes in post, but we knew what we were going to do and we knew everything. And the guy's like, okay. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to know, like, <laughs> just wanted to kind of know the story, like the filmmaking history of, of what happened here. Well, that's actually really weird because I read some statements also from Barry Sonnenfeld where he was like, yeah, you know, this whole thing of approaching the movie and starting without a complete script, because they did have somewhat some, part of a script, but not, it wasn't complete. Um, he was like, yeah, this is an experiment and we're just going to see where this takes us. We're going to see if this works, then maybe this is something we start doing in the future because like a fir- one of the first rules of movie making is you don't start without a full, fully completed script. Yeah. Um, but we're going to see where this takes us. If it fails, then then you know it fails and we don't do it again and if it succeeds then maybe this is something we start doing like you seem pretty open and like cool about like just saying that hey we don't have this script and it's a big a big experiment yeah but this this guy even quotes that in his introduction peg off he's like barry sonnefeld even said this like direct quote like this is an experiment like if it it's like if you'll know if it works when you see the movie and it's great and then it worked and if you see the movie and it sucks then you know it didn't work it's like direct quote you guys like i don't really understand why barry sonnefeld got so heated at me for just Kind of asking this question. I think it's actually really interesting, though, like, aside from that, because Barry Sonnenfeld talks a lot about, like, how they came up with the dynamic between Will Smith and Josh Brolin in the, in the third movie. Because he's like, you know, part of the reason why we cast Josh Brolin is because I saw him uh, in a different movie um, portraying George W. Bush. And I was like, that's George W. Bush. That's like, but it wasn't him doing... It wasn't him doing George W. Bush. It was him doing, like, an interpretation of it. And he talks about how... He really wanted audiences not to like be turned off by the fact that Tommy Lee Jones isn't on screen for the whole movie because he wanted audiences to just look at it and be like, that's Agent K. Agent K is on screen for the whole movie. Like maybe Tommy Lee Jones isn't there for the whole movie, but Agent K is on screen for the whole movie. And that, that was something that they worked like really hard between Josh Brolin and Tommy Lee Jones and, and Barry Sonnenfeld to like get that feeling right. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Also, apparently they couldn't go for the same thing as Men in Black 1 because Will Smith is like 49 now. And they were like, it'd be kind of weird if Will Smith was running around like plucky, young, amazed by everything like he was in Men in Black now. <laughs> well, they, the the times, not time skips, but the time span of the movies is in real time. So the sec two takes place five years after one. Yeah. Three takes place 10 years after two. But they didn't have to go that route. I mean, obviously, Will Smith actually looks pretty young still, even to this day. And they could have just done like young makeup to look, make him look even younger. But he, yeah. probably, he probably wouldn't have wanted to do that, I'm guessing. I, I, actually, I like the progression of, like, first it's this five-year thing, and now Agent J is, is more of a senior uh, agent in the Men in Black, and then ten years later, he's, you know... We kind of kind of see... We kind of go through Agent J's, like, progression within the Men in Black. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I found some B-roll footage of behind-the-scenes stuff, and I saw when they filmed the, uh, you know, the scene on the, I guess, unicycles... When uh, Will Smith spins around upside down, Josh and not Jason K is like, you got a feather throttle with fifteen percent psi or whatever. No, yeah, yeah, yeah all right. And uh, it's kind of funny because uh, you know in the movie, Agent K like zooms off and then he like comes back around from the other side in the frame. Basically, how they filmed that was Josh Brolin gets on this motorcycle, it wheels off screen. He gets off, he runs around the camera all the way, he runs all the way around, gets on another one that zooms into frame. <laughs> Thought that was pretty funny, actually. 
high tech movie techniques. <laughs> and they actually spun Will Smith upside down, which is kind of cool. Now, another, I guess, debacle that happened during this movie is there were rumors actually in around 2011, 2012 that it was going to be canceled. Yeah. Uh, it obviously didn't end up happening. Um, but I think people got wind of like the the Will Smith stuff and then Barry Sonnenfeld like going off off the handle. Um, and we're just like, what what is up with this movie? I mean, it has a really weird schedule, really weird budgetary things as well. I didn't fully understand. I read a little bit about this. I'm not going to actually dive into it because I didn't fully understand why or what they were what they well, were doing or why I they can were actually doing dive it. into this a little bit because he talks about this in this interview where I found because the guy asked him like, you know what? You know, a lot of people thought it was going to be canceled. Like what? What actually happened? Because they the filming went on hiatus for like a couple months, and that's why everybody thought it was going to be ca- canceled because filming just stopped. And Barry Sonnenfeld was like, "Yeah, we didn't." He's like, "I didn't want the whole movie to be on a studio, and the weather just like took a really bad turn for us, and we just couldn't film on location for like a couple months. So we just decided to go on hiatus because we couldn't film the outside shots right. basically anymore, right? Because the weather just basically." took a dump all over him. He's like, and I didn't want it to be all on a studio set. So that's what he claims. So that's, that's his explanation for what happened there. I also read that, I mean, see, there's dual explanations, at least for everything. Cause I also read that the, um, the break was planned of like, Hey, we're going to, cause they had a, they had a script for the first part that they made before this hiatus. And then they took the hiatus to solidify what they were going to do in the second half. Yeah. So I I don't know. I yeah. I don't know. Another who knows. Hearsay. Maybe we've all been hit by uh deneuralizers but they just like scrambled our memories instead of erasing them. <laughs> and uh Yeah, I actually don't have uh, much more about three. No, yeah, that's all I had. After three came out, there was a couple of rumblings about them making a fourth one, but they claimed that they were like, yeah, but their story is like done. Like the Agent K, Agent J story is done after three. Like there's nowhere else they could really go with that one. Which is why they did end up making a fourth one. It just came out. Um, but it's, it's, it's more being, of a spinoff. It's, yeah, it's yeah. being marketed heavily as a spinoff and not Men in Black 4. Well, because there was also originally a plan to do a crossover with a film series called 21 Jump Street. Yeah, or just Jump Street. Which twenty? There's twenty one Jump Street, and there's, and there's twenty two Jump Street. Twenty two Jump Street, and but then the the crossover was going to be called Men that. in Black twenty three. Yeah, or at least that was the working title. That's such a weird crossover. Uh, yeah, apparently they got like a, as far as writing a script, and then they were like, "This doesn't really work because like <laughs> really? I guess I guess because the type of humor of the two universes is like they're both comedies, but the like type of humor is like not in agreement between the two of them." Yeah, twenty one Jump Street. The, well, the one everyone knows from like 2012 or whatever um, is actually a remake, I believe. Yes. Of something. I think it was a movie. the 80s, yeah, I believe so. Might have been a TV show. I don't remember. Well, we have technology. <laughs> I can just Wikipedia this right now. 21. Is Wikipedia becoming a verb now like Google? Like, I'll just Google this. I'll just oh. Wikipedia this. Yeah, American police procedural television series that television aired on the series. Fox network. And in first run syndication from April twelfth, nineteen eighty seven to April twenty seventh, nineteen ninety one, with a total of one hundred three episodes. We should make a twenty one Jump Street podcast. Yeah, last about two years. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Inevitable's canceled. <laughs> God. <laughs> and yeah, then they made the spinoff. I've watched the spinoff. They basically make no mention of JOK anywhere in the movie, except for that there's like a painting of the climax of the first movie, like kind of in the background of one of the shots. And, and that's it. That's like oh. the entirety of the references to J and K, which is kind of weird J- considering they saved the world like three times. And you'd think that you think that'd be something that'd be notable, but, but I guess not. You have to wonder about all those other random agents who like don't ever save the world. At least on a big, as big a scale. Maybe they do, and we just don't know about it. I guess that's true. That's the kind of thing about the Men in Black universe is that none of the Men in Black get any recognition, and that's why like Jay, yeah, it was Jay, neuralizes Agent T in the second movie because he's like, 
you're never going to be a hero at the Men in Black because nobody's ever going to know what you did. Right. Um, so expanded universe stuff, there's a cartoon series. Which I only found out, like, looking stuff up for this. I was like, what the heck? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I knew this existed. I never watched it. There's also a bunch I, of video games, apparently. Like, a bunch of video games. Well, the first one was really popular with, with kids. So it makes sense that they would make this cartoon and these video games. Agent L appears in the cartoons, apparently. Because it's after the first movie yeah. before the yeah, second they... movie. Yeah. I do remember Men in Black being a pretty big deal around yeah. the early 2000s. It was like one of those turn-of-the-century franchises that everybody knew. The Matrix, Men, Men in, in Black, Black, Star Wars, and then Lord of the Rings in 2000. And yeah. Whatever. <clears throat> and, yeah. Danny Elfman did the music for these. Men in Black theme is actually like... I didn't realize how recognizable it was until I watched these movies and I heard them like, oh, I've heard that like a lot before. I, mean, I couldn't like whistle it right now if you asked me to. I don't no, know. neither could I. But like when you hear it, you're like, oh, it's a Men in Black thing. <laughs> and yeah, I have nothing else yeah, production wise. Yeah, all I had. Uh, I really like these movies and I actually think they work like really well as a trilogy. Um, um, we get I, to see the yes. progression of Jay throughout the years. And yeah, then in that's... the final movie, it serves almost as like an inversion of the first movie because now Jay is the senior agent, whereas K is the junior agent. Yeah, almost. And, and Jay learning about his uh, past could have worked better if you if they dropped like yeah or like the 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 qualms Jay had about his dad like in the first one, and then that gets resolved in the third one or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously they didn't know there was well, going to yeah, be a two and know. three. Um, might almost work better as just a duology, just skipping two entirely. Other than you'd have to explain how K got back in the game. <laughs> two almost also serves as an inversion of one because K's like got to get back in the game. They got to like denuralize him. And so during that time, Jay's like the guy in charge almost. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say the only reason it works well as a trilogy because of this whole, like you get to see Jay's progression. Other than that, I don't think it works particularly well as a trilogy. No, I guess it, it, it almost feels like a serialized kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, like a, a comic a, book. Almost with, like, with like a comic issues. book or like, hmm. or like, hmm, like, or like original... an X-Files kind of thing. <laughs> we have these like alien of the week th stories almost. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. I like that actually. I really like these movies yeah, like a lot cool. more than I thought I would watch going into it. Um, definitely enjoyed myself like quite a bit watching these movies, and they went by pretty quick. They have pretty quick pacing. Yeah, they're which is, they're, which they're is pretty nice short. as well. They're about an hour and a half to hour forty. F I think the third one is like an hour forty five. Yeah, that's about like average for, I guess, comedies nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, so if you'd like to email us, you can reach us at thedoctor.deckedvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on Men in Black. You can find us on YouTube at Decade of Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time, we're going to be watching Despicable Me. But until then, the end. <laughs>